Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for joining this event on uh, forced labor in the 2020 Turkmen cotton harvest. Um, if you would like to use social media to talk about this event, please use the hashtag NED events. There's no space there. It's just N-E-D-E-V-E-N-T-S. Um, before we get started, um, I want to note that there will be a Q&A at the end of the session. If you would like to leave uh, questions as they occur to you, there's a Q&A um, button in the lower right-hand corner of your Zoom window. You can leave your questions there. I ask that you leave you both your name and your affiliation when you leave your questions. Um, uh, I also want to add that there will be simultaneous interpretation into Russian during this event. Um, that button is just to the right of the Q&A button. Um, you need to select a language you want to listen to. Um, there's a mute original audio feature. If you um, need to hear the English, um, then you don't want to hit mute original audio. But if you just want to hear the translator, you hit mute original audio. Um, I will also add that this event will be recorded. Um, and I want, I want to start out by thanking all of our esteemed panelists and for joining and Ned staff for all the help that they provided. And with that, I'm going to introduce Allison Gill. Allison Gill is the Forced Labor Program Direct Director at Global Labor Justice International Labor Rights Forum and the coordinator of the Cotton Campaign. The Cotton Campaign is a multi-stakeholder coalition that has been working since 2008 to eradicate state and post-forced and child labor in the cotton sector in Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. And with that, I'll yield the floor to her and she, uh, she'll introduce the other guests as well. Thanks, Jeff. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to start by thanking Ned for hosting today's discussion and to all of you for coming today. It's great to be able to share this work so widely with such an engaged audience. I know there are a lot of experts listening and I'm, I'm grateful to you for coming. The report you're gonna hear about is a real milestone in the human rights work done on Turkmenistan. As those of you listening know well, it's easy to write off Turkmenistan as a lost cause, terrible or some kind of punchline but it's not a place where many people think that real human rights progress can be made and it's easy to ignore. Today's report tells a different story. It's a deep collaboration between two of the most experienced Turkmen human rights groups. It relies on on the ground research by networks of monitors, citizen reporters in Turkmenistan that receive training, guidance and support from their partners on the outside. The data sets collected independently by each of the organizations were compared and used to corroborate and complement each other to present a fuller picture of the forced labor system. The work in turn is supported by and used for advocacy with the Cotton Campaign. As Jeff said, it's a global coalition with NGO, union, investor, and academic partners that use campaigning, policy, business, and legal tools to fight for an end to forced labor. This is a model that requires time and investment, and we're grateful to NED for investing in and standing by this work and believing in this model for change. Before I introduce today's panelists, I'd also like to say a few words about the global relevance and timeliness of this work and of today's discussion. As I noted, um, it's too easy to think of Turkmenistan and the abuses occurring there as somehow separate from the rest of the world. But with so much global attention on forced labor and other grave systematic human rights abuses occurring against Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims in East Turkestan, referred to by the Chinese government as Xinjiang, the abuses in Turkmenistan in today's report are even more relevant. Cotton is a global commodity and doesn't stay within borders. As you will hear today, forced labor tainted cotton from Turkmenistan is entering global supply chains of apparel and home goods. As policymakers and brands focus on taking steps to remove forced labor tainted cotton produced in China from global supply chains and promote accountability for abuses there, they need to be looking more deeply across supply chains and across accountability tools to take similar measures on Turkmenistan. You will now hear from the main uh, authors of the report, Ruslan Mietiev and Farid, Farid Tukhbatulin. Ruslan is the founder and editor of Turkmen News, an independent media and human rights organization dedicated to the promotion of free speech and the rule of law in Turkmenistan, 
And I'm proud to say that Ruslan is a longtime partner and core member of the Cotton Campaign. Farid is the founder and director of the Turkmen Initiative for Human Rights, which provides independent news and information about Turkmenistan and is, one of, is considered one of the most credible sources of information on Turkmenistan. The Turkmen Initiative uh, maintains the Chronicles of Turkmenistan website and has published several alter alternative human rights reports for the UN and other human rights organizations. And I'm really happy that Farid has joined our collaboration with other Cotton Campaign members. You'll also hear from Anasuya Shyam, who is the Human Rights and Trade Policy Advisor at the Human Trafficking Legal Center. She leads an initiative on the US Tariff Act and forced labor, working with pro bono counsel, civil society groups, government, business, and others to insist on greater accountability in addressing forced labor in supply chains. And she will pr be presenting some information about Turkmenistan produced cotton in global supply chains. So thank you again to Jeff and to NED for today's discussion. And I'm happy to turn it over to Ruslan. Thank you very much, Alison. Uh, I will quickly put on my presentation. I have a few slides to show. Second. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Ruslan Miatiev. I'm the uh, editor of uh, Turkmen News. Uh, we strive to promote freedom of the press and the rule of law in Turkmenistan by bringing unbiased news from the country and uh, raising cases of human rights violations. Um, every year since 2013, Turkmen News has monitored the situation with forced labor during the cotton picking season. We uh, rely on uh, information sent to us by people who work in uh, the public sector and who receive orders from their supervisors uh, regarding cotton picking. Uh, all information obtained from them is uh, supported by audio recordings from staff meetings, as well as uh, photographs and videos from the fields. Uh, over, the last, uh, over the last eight years, our monitors have seen threats and intimidation from the government, imprisonment on bogus charges and complete denial of the problem with forced labor. What we haven't seen is attempts to reform the agricultural system. The 2020 forced labor monitoring has shown that despite challenges from COVID, let me remind you that the government of Turkmenistan is still denying the virus is present in the country. Tens of thousands of uh, civil servants were forced to pick cotton. Last year, we received um, dozens of photographs from the fields where even children in rural areas uh, picked cotton alongside uh, adults despite mandatory COVID related requirements to keep physical distance. In many cases, people were transported in overcrowded buses or in the backs uh, of, of trucks at freezing temperatures. In some regions, doctors and hospital personnel were freed from picking cotton because of the tough situation with the virus and the large number of patients, but the burden was shifted to school teachers and other civil servants. In early fall, we received an audio recording from one of the schools in Eastern Turkmenistan, uh, the Lebap region. This recording demonstrates that the forced labor system is organized and controlled by the government of Turkmenistan. The central government in Ashgabat defines the state plan for cotton. Every region gets its share. Then within region, that share is split among each state funded agency for example, Department of Education, Communication or Healthcare. The system goes down to specific schools, kindergartens or hospitals in which the principals or directors assign the picking quotas to individual teachers, nannies or nurses. That audio recording is not public for safety reasons of our monitors, but Turpin News can share it with selected participants uh, on this call. Please let me know if you would like to receive it. If one does not want to pick cotton or can't work in a field, say for health reasons, he can pay somebody to replace him. This practice is in place for a long time now, but in the past few years, paying to become free from cotton picking is actually endorsed by the heads of public services. 
if in all previous years you could send your relative or a friend to replace you at a cotton field. In 2020, in some regions, the officials simply extorted money from employees so that they could hire uh, pickers from among the residents of rural areas. In other words, you could no longer send your own replacement picker to the field. You had to pay money so that your boss would hire someone else. This practice is not only forced labor being required to pay money instead of work under threat of penalty. It also creates space for massive corruption. Let me give you one example. In schools, teachers and staff were divided into three groups of approximately 50 people in each group. From late August till the 12th of December, so almost four months, each group had to pay money three times a week so that their principal could hire replacement workers. So every day, uh, the principal received money from 50 people, but in reality, he never hired so many cotton pickers. He could hire, hire 20 replacements instead of 50 or not a single one at all. The teachers who pay the money never receive financial, financial reports from their uh, supervisors. This means that there are uh, entrenched financial incentives up and down the entire chain of command to keep the forced uh, labor system in place. There is another clue suggesting that this practice is corrupt. In regions like Lebab and Mari, farmers don't need outside helpers to pick their cotton. The land plots in these regions are rather small and the cotton yield in 2020 was not big either. Moreover, farmers have to pay the outside pickers, but uh, they would rather keep the money and pick the cotton themselves. My colleagues uh, from uh, Chronicles of Turkmenistan will talk more about the situation with cotton uh, farmers and uh, whether cotton production is profitable for them. I would like to highlight that during cotton harvesting, public sector workers had no holidays or weekends. During the school fall break in October, 100% of staff were forced to pick cotton. Because the regions were failing to meet the state plan, local officials were forcing citizens to pick cotton even on Sundays. Finally, uh, let me once again highlight a few key things. The government of Turkmenistan does not acknowledge the problem. Despite COVID restrictions, people, including children, from, uh, were forced to pick cotton. Women are affected the most by this issue. Second, the government chases our forced labor monitors. That's why most of the photographs that you saw in this presentation have been edited. They also chase our sources in the government and freelance reporters the government imprisons them on false charges. And uh, finally, the international community, including governments, businesses, financial institutions, media and rights groups should raise this, these issues with the government of Turkmenistan. Businesses should boycott Turkmen cotton and textiles and Western governments should impose bans for cotton and cotton products from Turkmenistan until there is a clear, verified by the civil society and irreversible change in the cotton sector of uh, the Turkmen economy. I'll stop here and we'll be happy to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. So, good day, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for organizing this uh, event and also having invited me to here. Thank you, Ruslan, for sharing your presentation. This is actually our joint shared presentation uh, with uh, the uh, and I want to just to tell you that our initiative was registered in Austria in 2004. Since uh, then, we have been monitoring uh, different topics, including uh, cotton harvesting. Uh, we focused uh, more um, uh, on not only on governmental employees uh, who are forced uh, to participate in cotton harvesting free of charge, but also on those uh, farmers who are, so to say, tied to their land plots uh, and uh, uh, they have to follow the practices and laws uh, that are left over and uh, that are actually the legacy of the Soviet Union uh, and that actually prevent them from leaving their regions uh, and going uh, to work elsewhere for a long period of time because we uh, have to, they have to register locally and actually we can see that the agricultural sector similar to other sectors does not take into account 
around the interests of the agriculture or the rural population, but rather focuses on the interests of the state only. I myself was also born in a rural area and um, I know the situation on the ground and uh, 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 Ruslan has just presented our joint uh, report uh, uh, that we prepared together with his organization and uh, some others. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, this uh, uh, report reflects uh, the, uh, the 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 people the, the position of the people who suffer most from the forced labor uh, in uh, cotton harvesting. And uh, again, you know that the land belongs. To to the state in Turkmenistan. So some land tenants, uh, they can do some work on their plots, but they cannot even choose which crop to grow on their plots. Uh, they get the instructions from above what specifically they have to grow. And uh, in most of the cases, this is cotton. They can cannot say no to the government, even if the land plots are too arid, for instance, or uh, are not uh, actually fit uh, for uh, cotton growing or at least for growing the cotton in the volumes that uh, uh, are imposed on the local farmers uh, according to the state plan. Uh, so this is what the farmers or the, the, the land tenants uh, uh, are facing uh, on, the, on the spot, on the ground. So the state actually does not, does not offer them any incentives whatsoever to motivate them to, to work more or to increase the harvest, uh, but rather just uh, imposes some instructions uh, and forces them to grow certain crops. Uh, again, as uh, our experience shows, uh, the experience of our initiative shows uh, in different sectors of uh, human rights protection, uh, the only way to persuade uh, Turkmen government to change the policies to initiate it to initiate reports is to involve the international community and to use the pressure from the international community to um, do international advocacy uh, and uh, uh, for instance uh, uh, the committee on child rights has managed to uh, make the Turkmen government give up the idea of involving children massively uh, in forced labor. So our government has been forced uh, to, to, to change the situation in this field. And uh, we do hope that our efforts uh, um, together with the cotton campaign would also uh, push uh, our government towards changing the situation, towards uh, lifting this, uh, I will, may I say so, slavery practices, uh, and would let the farmers grow what they actually want uh, and what would be more beneficial for them to grow on their land plots uh, because they would prefer growing some other crops that are in higher demand at local markets and that would give them the actual cash profit rather than grow cotton that they have to submit to the state and get actually nothing, no cash in return. So this is why we do pin hopes that the, our, our work would be really beneficial for the local people and would actually uh, uh, trigger a change. So that's it. And if I, if you have any questions, I will answer them later. Our fourth panelist is having some connection issues, unfortunately, um, but she'll join us shortly. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to ask some questions. And I would also add that, um, I would also add that you can feel free to um, ask questions yourself in the Q&A box. Um, so I'd like to start out by asking the panelists about, um, about the role of international financial institutions um, in this system. How do, they, uh, how do they, if at all, contribute to the sort of systemic problems that perpetuate forced labor in the cotton system? And then also, what, is there anything that they can do to help address the problem? Ruslan, do you want to start uh, with the question about the investment banks, the EBRD, or would you like me to take it? 
I'm seeing here only one question about the payments uh, for replacement. Uh, I didn't. The question that Jeff just asked. So why don't I just give a brief introduction and sure. um, and then Ruslan, it'd be great if you could pick it up. So um, the investment banks have a really important role to play in helping to stop forced labor, and we've seen this as well in Uzbekistan. But they can also, um, in violation of their own performance standards. Um, prop up or you know, support businesses that are profiting from forced labor. And so right now um, we're watching very closely discussions around some potential lending in Turkmenistan that would go to a business that it, um, in fact may be benefiting from or profiting from, uh, from forced labor. So I think Ruslan, I'm, I'm happy to turn it to you to, to put a little bit more detail to that and, and we can pick up the discussion, but it is a really important moment because all of the investment banks the EBRD and the World Bank, the IFC, their performance standards require that, that their clients respect freedom of association um, and that they do not in any way support forced labor. Yes, Alison, thank you. Just to correct uh, a little bit, uh, that loan to a private company in Turkmenistan was already given uh, last year in November. Uh, we, what we plan to do now is simply to raise a red flag to them and say that, uh, uh, well, we've discovered that this particular company, uh, their major business in, is in um, uh, cotton logistics. It's a logistics company. And uh, most of the profit that they receive uh, comes from uh, cotton and textile shipments. That's what, what we want to flag and perhaps uh, take it from there to see if we can uh, develop it uh, further. Um, great. I have a, another international um, question. This is sort of um, a personal question, but like what, what other sort of Western institutions are there that sort of perpetuate this process? Like how is it enabled in the West? Where do the proceeds of this, uh, the, the cotton harvest go? Um, how are they used? Do they go into state coffers? Do they go into personal coffers? And, and what systems sort of perpetuate this? That's a very good question, Jeff. Uh, the problem uh, is that uh, Turkmenistan uh, is a country that uh, is not very accountable, very much accountable to uh, its own citizens. Uh, cotton exports and cotton trading, cotton production, cotton industry is one of the uh, biggest uh, sources of income uh, for the government after oil and gas industry. However, the population is left in the dark. The population does not know who benefits from the from from uh, all of the cotton trading? Uh, very recently, we discussed with uh, other uh, colleagues about how much the state pays the farmers for each ton uh, of collected cotton, and how much the same ton of cotton, metric ton, costs on the on the um, markets, uh, international markets. So uh, we found out that uh, farmers don't receive uh, even eight percent of the world uh, price for a ton of cotton. So there is no information absolutely how this money uh, from cotton trading, uh, you know, is used, uh, who benefits from it, given uh, the fact that Turkmenistan is a uh, autocratic kleptocracy, let's say, uh, there is a very high potential, high risk that uh, the entire industry, uh, the, the, the ruling elites benefit from the entire industry. I would add to Ruslan's comments that even though Turkmenistan is in many ways isolated from international systems, we know that there's a lot of money at stake in cotton production. And then that money also tends to travel across borders, probably to international financial institutions and bank and into the banking system. And that there's also international investment in Turkmenistan and specifically in the cotton sector. Some 20% of the Turkmen cotton sector is actually owned of, of equipment, of, of facilities connected to cotton, spinning, dyeing, textile mills are actually owned by Turkish investors. So we, we very much know that, that the Turkmen cotton system is not isolated and that the profits are, are flowing across borders. And that, you know, it's a, it's a really good point, Jeff. It's one that we're looking at in the cotton campaign um, because we, in our work on Uzbekistan, um, we made some progress in tracing the, the cotton the cotton money flows and it helped us gain influence over the system. So we're looking into that work in Turkmenistan as well. 
Thank you. Um, the, the bringing up in Uzbekistan um, raises a good question, and Rachel Denver from Human Rights Watch actually asked it. Um, to what extent um, is the, our Turkmen authorities paying attention to both the role of the Khan campaign and the reforms that have been that have taken place in inside Uzbekistan? We've seen really quite significant changes just across the border in terms of um, the extent of forced labor and then just the way uh, um, the cotton harvest is performed nationally. Um, much of it has been privatized um, with some success and, and, and some not. Um, but um, like, and I, I mean, I think I'd also point to just the sort of just the su successful human rights outcomes that the cotton campaign has achieved um, in Uzbekistan. Um, so I guess the question is in two parts. It's, is, the Uzbek, is the Turkmen government paying attention? And then second, um, like I guess the part that I would add is, um, what, what lessons did the cotton campaign learn from the Uzbek piece that can then be applied in Turkmenistan to maybe lay the groundwork for some future success? I'm happy to start with some lessons learned for the cotton campaign generally. And I would leave it to Ruslan and Farid to talk about uh, their views on the Turkmen government and, and how closely they might be following either our work or the changes in, in Uzbekistan. So on the cotton campaign, one thing that we've learned very clearly is that this is a marathon, not a sprint. And it does take um, a lot of careful investing in civil society partners and particularly partners on the ground who can gather evidence and connect that evidence to the global advocacy work um, that our partners do because that's really important in building the case for change. Um, we also learned in the work in Uzbekistan that you know, there's a whole variety of um, legal policy advocacy and campaigning tools at our disposal, um, both for direct accountability as well as bringing some, kind of, some kinds of indirect pressure. And so we're really ramping up the work in that area in Turkmenistan. We know that the government follows our work pretty closely um, Ruslan can talk about some of the um, specific signals that we've received, but I would re be really interested in hearing what Farid and Ruslan think about, um, about watching changes across the border in Uzbekistan. Um, definitely, the Turkmen government is uh, watching both uh, the activities of the cotton campaign, uh, where we're heading, what we're doing, how we are advocating for the respect of uh, labor rights of Turkmen citizens, as well as uh, they're watching the developments in Uzbekistan. Two years ago, when we met in Washington for the same uh, event, uh, I mentioned, I said that uh, uh, the, when, when the Uzbek delegation sat around the round table and spoke with the civil society, I said that the time will come when the Turkmen's will have to do it because there is simply no way out but to really start uh, the discussion. Uh, it, it should begin with the acknowledgement of the problem uh, and then, uh, you know, developing some sort of a roadmap to to uh, eliminate the issue and uh, bring back uh, the turpin textiles and uh, the turpin cotton to the international markets they're definitely watching uh, the political system in turkmenistan is such that uh, the decision making process is uh, heavily dependent on uh, the uh, mood and on the on the initiatives of the first man in the country the president of turkmenistan uh, those officials who are uh, slightly on lower positions, even vice prime ministers, even uh, ministers or uh, other people, other officials, they usually don't take the initiative to come to the president and say, uh, Mr. President, we there is a problem with this. We need to uh, do this and that. Uh, taking initiative in Turkmenistan is punishable. Uh, many officials, all officials know it. That's why they are not even trying to approach the government with uh, any, any proposals for uh, reform. Farid, did you want to add anything to that before we, before, before we switch from this question? <laughs> Я во многом согласен и с вами, и с Русланом, и такой тоже, наверное, можно назвать как реакцию. You, Alison, and with Ruslan, and uh, uh, 
I can tell you that the governments are looking for informants. Uh, they are trying to collect some information about our activities. Uh, and uh, there have been cases when some people were even arrested for uh, providing us information. So this is a painful situation, but this is what is happening. Thank uh, you. Final panelist, um, resolve your connection issues. So I want to cede the floor to Anna Suyo Siam, um, who is the Human Rights and Trade Policy Advisor at the Human Trafficking Legal Center. Um, once she makes her remarks, we will resume our Q&A. Um, I just want to remind the attendees to please leave comments in the Q&A box, not the chat box. Um, it'll be much easier for us to uh, track your question that way. Um, and with that, um, Anna Suya, uh, I will leave the floor to you. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to try and share my screen for the presentation. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen now. All right. Um, so I'm Asya Shyam. Um, I work at the Human Trafficking Legal Center, where I look at uh, accountability in supply chains for forced labor. Um, and so today's presentation will focus on the US prohibition on goods made using forced labor under the US Tariff Act of 1930. Turkmenistan cotton was one such product that was prohibited in 2018 by US Customs and Border Protection. So the first part of the presentation will focus very briefly on um, giving you a quick background of the law and move uh, very quickly after that to the supply chain findings and how goods made using Turkmenistan cotton are still retailing on US uh, e-commerce marketplaces. So the law, which is uh, the US Tariff Act, it prohibits the importation of goods which are uh, mined, uh, manufactured, or produced using forced labor, forced child labor, or prison labor from entering the United States. The agency that is tasked with administering this law is US Customs and Border Protection. So typically, um, CBP, or US Customs and Border Protection, conducts investigations based on information submitted by external sources. Um, so in the Tuckman content case, you know, um, uh, International Labor Rights Forum in 2016 filed a petition on um, forced labor in Turkmenistan's cotton harvest, um, uh, cotton harvest ban, um, which resulted in this ban in 2018. Now, taking a step back into this law, so Customs and Border Protection can detain goods made using forced labor at all U.S. ports of entry. It can do it through this um, order called detention order or a withhold release order, which is the technical term for the order under the U.S. law. Um, but it's not just detention orders that Customs and Border Protection can issue. It can also issue something called a finding, which it did very recently against a Malaysian glove manufacturer for forced labor in its Malaysian uh, glove factories. And after a finding, U.S. Customs and Border Protection can not only detain goods, but it can also seize those goods. Um, so this is another tool, which is at the disposal of U.S. Customs. Uh, U.S. Customs can also impose monetary penalties on U.S. importers for forced labor under related laws. It did that just last year, imposing a 575,000 penalty against a Chinese manufacturer of uh, the artificial, artificial sweetener stevia. Now, who can CBP target? CBP can target either a specific manufacturer or producer, a specific foreign manufacturer or producer. It can target entire product lines from a region or country, and it can even target fishing vessels for forced labor. So the prime example of such a region-wide prohibition is the ban on Turkmen cotton from 2018 because of the wonderful reporting and petition and information submitted by ILRF and Alternative Turkmen News um, in 2016. This is how the, the prohibition features on cbp.gov, the website for US Customs and Border Protection. Um, so it has banned all Turkmenistan cotton or products produced in whole or in part with Turkmenistan cotton. And this, um, it has been illegal in the United States since May 2018. Now, about a year later, there were reports about how um, e-commerce platforms like Amazon, Walmart, and eBay were still allowing third-party sellers to retail their goods containing Turkmenistan cotton. Um, and there was a lot of furor about this, and I think Amazon took down some of these goods. But three years later, 
we seem to have the same problem. So here we are again. And just, just to uh, make a mention, these images were taken in the last one month from certain e-commerce platforms. So on Wayfair.com, for example, if you search for Turkmenistan, you can find hundreds of products retailing explicitly with Turkmenistan origin. These include bath towels, bath mats, luxury bedding, and even wholesale fabric by the yard. So I've taken these images just to show you how um, these goods are retailing. So you can see under product specification and country of origin that Turkmenistan is mentioned. It is 100% cotton. Um, and even some brands have uh, uh, captured a label which says that it, it's from the, I think the Ashgabat textile complex. Correct me if I'm wrong, Ruslan and Farid, uh, but I think that's what it says. So you can just see how explicitly this is now retailing on uh, e-commerce marketplaces in the United States. This is the example of the luxury bedding that I was talking about. These are retailing for 200 to 300 US dollars a piece on Wayfair.com and also on other marketplaces. Now, kind of taking a step back and looking at the 50,000 feet view of how this could be entering the United States or other markets in the European Union. So these are not coming directly into the United States. There are no direct imports of raw cotton from Turkmenistan into the United States. It is coming from third countries. And we see that the biggest destinations for raw cotton exports in 2019 was, of course, Turkey um, and followed by Russia, by Armenia, by Belarus, and by Poland. And I'm really interested in also looking at the fastest growing export markets for the, for the pure uh, cotton from Turkmenistan, which was Belarus, Armenia, and Pakistan. And I would like you to put a pin on Pakistan for now, because I will be uh, coming back to Pakistan a little later. Um, there were a lot of articles about how Turkish textiles are tainted with Turkmenistan cotton, and this is definitely something to keep in mind. And uh, beyond Turkey, you also see that it is entering directly into the supply chains of certain European countries, which is like Portugal, Italy, Lithuania, France, among many others. This is news from um, a Turkmenistan news website where the cotton and spinning factories uh, are kind of boasting about their big export destinations and where the demand is for Turkmenistan cotton. So you see um, in one of the articles it mentions Turkmen cotton is in high demand among major companies in the United Arab Emirates, the USA, Turkey, um, and the other article mentions, um, like I mentioned earlier, Turkey, Poland, and recently they started sending batches to Qatar. This is just a snapshot from the trade database Panjiva, which gives import and export information for the United States and other countries. And this is just an example to show recent uh, where recent Turkmen 2020 cotton harvest exports are going. So this is why I said put a pin on Pakistan, because I'm seeing a lot of trends where the 2020 cotton harvest is going to mills in Pakistan um, and in Turkey. But I don't know if that's captured. No, um, sorry. So I just have the screenshot for the imports that are going to a few textile mills in Pakistan. And you can see it's clearly labeled Turkmenistan raw 2020 cotton. Um, this is from the Pakistan import export database. You can again see how much quantity is going to Pakistan. And this is really, I mean, even though it's not significant in 2019, I suspect that right now it has risen to a more significant number from Turkmenistan. Um, and just, you know, wrapping up and just trying to set the stage for more questions. What do we need and what does all this information mean? We know that the goods are entering supply chains of big importing economies. Many of the times it's not coming directly, at least in the United States, it's not coming directly. It is coming via third countries. So I think we need more accountability in supply chains. And first and foremost, we need more robust enforcement of the US ban on Turkmenistan cotton, kind of keeping an eye on where these third country trends are. Um, Customs and Border Protection should detain more shipments at the US border and find those who are found violating the forced labor prohibition. I mean, this has been enforced for three years now. There's been plenty of notice for all stakeholders to extricate their supply chains off of Turkmenistan cotton. The second one, and this was also in the Thomson Reuters Foundation article that I mentioned earlier, e-commerce platforms must take more responsibility. They should uh, take, uh, they should remove goods made using, they should not allow goods made using forced labor from retailing on their websites. They should sign on to the Turkmen Cotton Pledge as well. Um, and brands must conduct due diligence to ensure that goods that are subject to a US customs detention order are not entering their supply chains or taking their supply chains, even if it's very downstream.
Um, more recommendations can, of course, be found in wonderful uh, report by Ruslan and Farid. But I just want to land on this note that there should be no safe harbor for goods made using forced labor. We are very encouraged to see that Canada enacted a prohibition on goods made using forced labor and has de made developments on internal infrastructure for forced labor investigations. And we hope issues of re-exportation and transshipment will be a thing of the past and more borders will close to goods made using forced labor. Thank you, and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you, Anasuya. Um, uh, now, I think I'm going to go to a question from uh, Nayab Khan, uh, who is the Regional Policy Advisor for the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues, covering South and Central Asia. Um, she wants to hear about the forced labor issue from a gender perspective. How does it affect women and girls more broadly and what can be done moving um, forward? Um, are there any recommendation, recommendations to keep more gendered aspects in mind when looking at forced labor issues? I think Ruslan, you had, um, you had some comments that you answered in the in the Q and A. Yeah, could you quickly repeat the question, please, Jeff? Okay, so um, Nayab Khan asks um, uh, if if you could address forced labor from a gender perspective, how it affects women and girls more broadly. Yeah. What can be done moving forward? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I answered that, uh, I think, in private or anyhow, but uh, indeed there is, uh, we, in, in the report that uh, you will read, we particularly focused on the fact that uh, women are mostly, are, are affected by the forced labor system the most, because um, it's uh, a custom in uh, the post-Soviet countries and in Turkmenistan in particular that, for example, uh, the staff of hospitals or schools or kindergartens and these institutions are affected by the forced labor system the most. So in these institutions, mostly women work. The same can be said about the, for example, public utilities, the street cleaners, uh, these are the most the, the lowest paid jobs in Turkmenistan and uh, are mostly occupied by by women. At the same time, uh, it's these services that are sent uh, to pick cotton uh, in the first place. So it comes with uh, w the, the cotton harvest season comes with them, uh, starts with them. So it's uh, rather safe to say uh, that uh, women are uh, affected by the forced labor system the most. There was also a question about um, uh, the replace paying for replacements. It was one of the first questions and I really, uh, from Nancy Lubin, uh, she's asking whether the when when the payments uh, for replacements have become legal. They are not legal. This is all illegal. Nobody, no government official, no public institution official shows a paper uh, or an order uh, that is stamped, that is signed uh, by somebody. No, this is of course done unofficially. And uh, regarding the amounts. It really depends on the appetites of uh, this or other uh, public uh, office uh, chief. Uh, last year, for example, it was from 20 to 30 manats. Uh, manat is a Turkmen currency. And uh, the rate, if you uh, convert it into dollars back then, it was somewhere about, uh, around one American dollar uh, per day. Uh, this might uh, sound uh, cheap. This might sound... Um, uh, insignificant, but keep in mind that uh, salaries in Turkmenistan are very, very low. For example, a full-time teacher uh, that has uh, uh, for, forty that works forty hours a week uh, earns uh, somewhere around sixty-eight to to seventy-five American dollars per month, not per day, not per hour, per month. So, paying uh, three times a week uh, an amount of one dollar. So three dollars a week uh, is is uh, significant for for them, and uh, also the unemployment rate in Turkmenistan is quite high. Uh, in many cases, uh, there is only one breadwinner in a family. Uh, in in many cases, uh, the breadwinners are women, and uh, you can imagine the burden uh, that they uh, that they have. Uh, when they need to feed their families and work at the same time and still uh, contribute to the cotton harvest. 
А, Фри, ви хочете щось додати? Да, я хотел бы добавить, необходимо учитывать следующий yes, момент. Yes, I would like to add something. So I have some experience in environmental issues as well. And we know that such a routine, uh, massive cotton harvesting uh, uh, delivers a strong blow on the environment. Uh, and back in the uh, 80s, 90s, when we started discussing uh, problems openly, we knew that the maternity and child deaths in Turkmenistan were the highest in the region. Uh, and one of the reasons was the herbicide use uh, for cotton production, cotton harvesting, that actually affects women's reproductive system first. And uh, this is uh, one of the reasons and one more factor that illustrates the damage on uh women and girls um she asks about the large number of well the large clothing retailers um, including h m that have raised concerns about forced labor in cotton production in east turkestan in xinjiang um do you um see this pr uh, approach concerns and bans coming from private businesses rather than international institutions as effective and is it something that can be done to stop forced labor in turkmenistan and then i would add to that question um uh what what opportunities does the attention on forced labor in East Turkestan raise for um, civil society and activists trying to address forced labor in Turkmenistan? I'm happy to take a start at that, Jeff, if that's okay with Ruslan and Farid. Um, I mean, it's an interesting framing of the question to say that the concerns about forced labor were raised by H&M when in fact, you know, from my perspective, um, the concerns about forced labor have been raised for a long time by the Uyghur community and by researchers and reporters and others who have really exposed the system of abuses there um, and forced brands to take a closer look at their supply chains. Um, and so it's, um, brands have the obligation to have full traceability of their supply chains to really understand where all of their imports inputs are coming from and how those inputs are produced. Um, clothing, apparel, cotton supply chains are, are pretty opaque traditionally and quite com co quite complex. Um, and so it's been a real issue for brands to understand um, down to the raw material where, where all of their inputs are coming from. But the crisis in the Uyghur region, I think really exposes how crucial it is for them to do that. And it really does provide an opportunity to look more closely at a place like Turkmenistan, where there is also a systemic abuse occurring, forced labor um, that is part that is a key component of this global supply chain. Um, so now I think brands, as they start to take action to disentangle their supply chains from forced labor and forced labor produced inputs in the Uyghur region um, and in put in place stricter um, traceability standards and systems to understand where their materials are coming from, they need to be doing that globally and including in Turkmenistan where, you know, as Anasuya's research shows, we know that Turkmen cotton is finding its way um, into the global supply chain directly through, you know, goods that are directly available from Turkmenistan, as Anasuya showed, but also um, in ways that are more difficult to trace. Cotton is spun into cotton yarn, which is done in Turkmenistan, and, in, um, and that yarn is sold to uh, fabric mills in Pakistan and in Turkey. Um, sometimes raw cotton is exported and, and spun into yarn in other places, and it's amalgamated with cotton from other areas. So there really do need to be much, much stronger due diligence measures by brands. Frida or Ruslan, do you have anything to add to this question? Or Anasuya, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, in which case, we've got a question from Miriam Lanskoy. She's the Senior Director for Russia and Eurasia at the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, she um, is asking about lessons from the Uzbekistan piece, um, particularly about privatization. Um, has privatization improved human rights practices there? Um, and is that are there lessons that could be learned um, to once applied to Turkmenistan? Like, is, is privatization a, a a good uh, eventual option for Turkmenistan? 
I can start with that. That's a very good question. Uh, in Turkmenistan, indeed, the process of privatization uh, is in place. Uh, many state uh, organizations, many uh, state stores and other um, entities are being offered for privatization. However, we cannot talk about uh, whether privatization could help eliminate the problem because we still have state plans. Just like in the Soviet Union, uh, every region, regardless if there are capacities, if there is enough water, if there is enough manpower, uh, if there is enough fertilizer and chemicals, they have to collect a certain amount of uh, cotton. And uh, in most of the cases, this, these plants, these quotas are so high uh, that uh, and 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 the, the regions uh, for the past I think uh, four or five years have been failing in reality to meet the plan. Officially, of course, uh, the plans were met, but uh, in 2019 we have seen that farmers were even giving up their lands because it was so not beneficial for them to uh, produce cotton. They would rather go to Turkey or northern Cyprus and work there as uh, labor migrants. Uh, uh, and uh, still would be able to send, you know, $100 or $200 uh, to their relatives at home. Uh, so un uh, until the moment, uh, un until we have this uh, uh, state plan system, uh, no privatization would, would be uh, helpful to eliminate the problem. Could I add a little bit to that as well from the Uzbek perspective? Of course. Um, I would say that <laughs> Corporations are not the best guarantors of labor rights. Um, and that simply shifting the responsibility of production from a government to a private entity really does nothing um, to impact forced labor necessarily. It can, um, but it doesn't have to. Uzbekistan has really taken, I mean, they have really taken a lot of steps to address forced labor. I'm not disputing that in any way, but their approach is really centered on this privatization and very rapid privatization without a lot of checks on how that system is being implemented. And it's taken a really top down approach of emphasizing legislative reforms and enforcement along with privatization. And what's been really missing is that bottom up um focus on systems and groups and actors that can really promote transparency and accountability from the bottom so even though we've seen this rapid privatization and a real reduction in the numbers of people forced to pick cotton we haven't really seen an opening of the civil society space a significant opening of the civil society space or a kind of serious improvement in the enabling environment that it would allow um, private entities to be held accountable. So even though forced labor has certainly reduced significantly in Uzbekistan, other labor rights abuses are emerging. You know, this the single attention on forced labor is in some ways obscured kind of health and safety issues, um, contract pay, working conditions, working hours, and other kinds of labor issues that are now cropping up in these private entities. And so in, in my view, you know, the both the vaccine and the cure, if you will, for forced labor is freedom of association. And so there needs to be a real effort in whatever system, private or public, that the workers themselves be free to come together and negotiate their own labor rights. And when that is in place, when the workers themselves have a seat at the table and a voice um, and can report on abuses as they occur, I think that's probably the, the critical ingredient for any of these systems to be able to really eliminate forced labor in a robust and lasting way. Thank you, Allison. Um, do any of our other panelists have anything they'd like to add to this question? Okay, um, in which case we have a question from Sebastian Peruz from the, um, the Central Asia Program at uh, George Washington University. Um, he wants to know if there's any information on the share of cotton revenues injected into the state budget um, and, and, and the, the, the amount of them that are diverted into offshore accounts for the benefit of Rudy Mukameda's family and other Turkmenistani elites. Um, 
In other words, can you elaborate on how the financial benefits and proceeds of the cotton are used? Well, uh, in part, that question uh, was uh, answered already. Uh, Turkmenistan is a very closed society. Uh, there is no accountability. There is no transparency in, in uh, who owns what, where, and how. Uh, we, with colleagues at the OCCRP, the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, are looking at, are working on several stories actually uh, at the moment and we have identified for example that it's not related to cotton or um, yet but maybe we'll get uh, there too one day it is related to uh, other uh, products of uh, Turkmenistan's um, economy and it seems that indeed uh, companies that belong uh, to very close family members uh, of President Birdu Mohamedov benefit from uh, imports and exports, especially exports. Uh, I, can, I cannot really tell the full story now. Uh, in in uh, one or two weeks, uh, there will be a big publication. So uh, please keep an eye on it. We very much look forward to reading that, Ruslan. Um, uh, do any of our other panelists want to add on that? Otherwise, I, I'll go to um, the next batch of questions. Okay, um, so we've got a question from Chloe Cranston. Uh, she asks, um, we have seen actions from the United States in regards to the um, WRO. Um, although recognizing it needs better enforcement, uh, could you comment on what you'd like to see from others? Um, for example, other governments, the United Nations, the International Labor Organization and funding institutions. And I'm gonna batch in with that a question from Julia Reynitz. Um, she says that, um, given the lack of transparency in Turkmenistan's cotton sector, are there recommended best practices for brands to identify their risk of Turkmen cotton entering supply chains via third countries? Um, I can I can take a stab at that one. Um, so to answer Chloe's question, and I think I may have alluded to this briefly in my recommendations, is that the U.S. is one country and it has this law, but we need this to be a global effort against forced labor. It is a systemic issue. It's not a one-off isolated incident. So you need systems changes to tackle this systemic issue. And I think more governments need to be more attuned to this, this problem and should enact import bans in their jurisdictions. And where there are um, you know, um, where there's a push to mandatory human rights due diligence or where there are modern slavery laws already. Um, it is also a question of making sure that non-compliance is met with penalties, right? Um, I think we've seen that voluntary measures from corporations have failed to curb this problem. We do need a stick where there is non-compliance. So I think I would I would focus, um, I would recommend that, you know, uh, governments focus on that. And I do think there is a role for the UN here as well. I think um, the UN mandates, the special mandates, special rapporteurs mandates um, should issue communications, should intervene where it is possible, because there's so much evidence already out there. And the, the, the information that I showed in my presentation, it is publicly available. Um, anyone can go to these websites, look up uh, where Turkmenistan cotton is headed, how how it's tainting these global supply chains. So I do think this has to be a global fight and um, we need similar prohibitions in other countries as well. Thank you. Um, anyone else would like to add? Yeah, just to quickly add to that, uh, we of course want uh, European countries also to uh, develop some sort of policies related to Turkmen cotton. Uh, there is a good resource called uh, ComTrade. It's a UN uh, trade. Um, it shows statistics on uh, the flow of trade between countries. Uh, we have seen that uh, in 2018, in 2019, a lot of Turkmen cotton, like literally hundreds of tons, were exported to countries like Portugal, Spain, Italy, Germany, France, uh, some of the Baltic countries. And uh, yes, it's, it's bad news uh, for us, for the civil society. Uh, we at the same time want uh, more businesses, more companies to pay attention to Turkmenistan and sign the cotton pledge. We are not enemies of Turkmenistan, we want Turpin jeans, Turpin towels of excellent quality, I should say. We want Turpin bed linen to enter American markets or European markets. 
but one, only once the, the problem with forced labor has been eliminated. That's the only thing that, uh, that, is, that is there and needs to be fixed. Otherwise, if uh, we would be more than happy to see Turkmen textiles or cotton, uh, you know, being sold in, in, uh, in the Dutch markets here or in the American stores, they need to fix the problem of forced labor. Thank you, Ruslan. Um, we have a question from Matthew Schaaf from Freedom Now. Um, he asked if you are aware of any cotton related financing coming from government supported import export banks, which could potentially be a target for pressure. Um, has advocacy with such institutions or in other contexts worked in the past? I can start with that one. Um, hi, Matthew. It's nice to, nice to have a question for you. I'm glad you're in the audience. Um, I'm not aware of import-export bank financing. I mean, we mentioned earlier in the presentation um, an EBRD loan to a logistics company, and I think there are other things like that um, that we need to be keeping an eye on. Um, but we know that, that the banks have a really important role to play. And in fact, it was a, a complaint that we made to the World Bank um, on Uzbekistan that was one of the kind of key levers that was um, accelerated the, the pace of change and, and what we were able to accomplish there. And that was a loan that wasn't directly to the cotton sector, but it was one that benefited the cotton sector. It was a loan to revamp irrigation systems. And so we're kind of looking for ways in like that where uh, the international financial institutions are, you know, supporting or propping up um, either the system indirectly or directly or entities that benefit from the forced labor. Um, but Ruslan and Farid, maybe you're aware of more direct import-export uh, bank activity. No. Okay. Um, we have another question from Rachel Denver from Human Rights Watch. Um, she says, as she asks, regarding countries in the region where Turkmen cotton is exported, Belarus, Armenia, Russia, um, she guesses that these governments have no mechanisms to block imports of goods produced from forced labor. Even so, has the campaign been in touch with civil society groups, uh, for instance, Belarus or Armenia or even Russia, to try to bring awareness about forced labor in Turkmenistan? Um, and um, has the campaign done this in Uzbekistan as well? Well, uh, I can say that uh, within the cotton campaign, we're also part of the Central Asian Monitoring uh, Group, uh, which also includes representatives from uh, Eastern Europe, uh, from Belarus, Ukraine, the Caucasus, I believe, and Russia. And when we meet in the when we met in the pre-COVID times, we of course raised uh, their awareness about the situation in Turkmenistan. But unfortunately, uh, this engagement was only with the civil society of those countries. No governments, no government representatives were present in such meetings, and it would be probably that's my personal opinion. It would be really uh, odd to see that, uh, for example, the Russian government would be caring so much about the situation in, uh, in Turkmenistan, uh, you know, where they're all enemies around <laughs> that region. And uh, yeah, so uh, we, we don't really, uh, they A, indeed, they don't have mechanisms to spot uh, forced labor. And frankly speaking, they don't have willingness to do so. I would just, add to Ruslan's comments um, that yes, we've tended to do this kind of work through trade unions and through trade union networks, um, solidarity networks across the region, and also through brands and companies, because if they're not importing, you know, finished goods, if they're importing inputs or, you know, cotton yarn or fabric or other, other cotton inputs, then the way that we've seen most effective to bring pressure is, is on the companies themselves rather than the governments or the NGOs who have a harder time tracing you know, what happens to a bale of cotton or a spool of cotton yarn once it crosses a border. And I just wanted to add to that, you know, where there isn't such a difficulty and maybe the supply chains are a little clearer, 
civil society groups anywhere in the world, if they have any supply chain links to the United States, can petition US Customs to block those imports. Um, and now I think in Canada as well, um, Canadian government updated their website with uh, an email where you can email allegations of forced labor. This can be done anonymously on the US side, at least it is protected. Thank you. Um, we have some questions from uh, Gubadi Badolu, who um, works on forced labor elsewhere in the region. Um, he wants to know about the role and position of the International Labor Organization in regards to um, particularly employees being forcibly, like public employees forcibly being involved in the harvest. Um, and also, he's interested uh, about the extent of child labor and UNICEF's interest in this issue. Um, he also has some other questions about the use of chemical reagents in um, cotton and um, the ratio um, of uh, manual cotton harvesting to mechanized cotton harvesting. Hi, Gubad. It's nice to see you and thanks for joining us. Um, in regards to the ILO engagement on Turkmenistan, Ruslan, do you want to take that? I would rather take uh, the child labor and uh, some okay. other. The so the, I, we know that the ILO is watching the situation in Turkmenistan. The ILO is a tripartite organization, you know, comprised of unions and employers and governments, really requires the cooperation of the Turkmen government in order to operate on the ground in Turkmenistan. So we have engaged with the ILO uh, we know that they're watching the situation. We know that there are maybe some offers of technical assistance, but there is no ILO monitoring mission or technical assistance or better work, decent work program that I'm aware of um, currently. Just to add to that, uh, I can say that the ILO is well aware of the situation in, Tur in Turkmenistan. We, uh, I think early last year before the borders closed, uh, we met with the ILO representatives. They were well aware of the situation. And uh, they actually said that um, uh, Turkmenistan was interested in uh, working with the ILO, but uh, it was still on the stage of uh, discussions and negotiations. No, nothing concrete was, uh, no decisions, no concrete decisions were made. Uh, just wanted to comment on the UNICEF uh, and the, the child labor in Turkmenistan. Uh, I answered already one of those questions related to child labor uh, in the chat. Uh, since, 20, uh, since 2007, uh, children, school children are not being sent to cotton fields uh, on government orders. However, and last year we noticed that too, uh, children do work in the cotton fields. In most of the cases, they replace their family members, their parents who are public servants and uh, who do other things like do uh, work at home, for example, and they, they send their kids uh, to replace them. In uh, some cases, children uh, miss schools indeed uh, in the rural areas that that, that uh, mostly applies to the rural areas they miss schools to support their families because uh, in, on uh, larger land plots uh, farmers do uh, receive uh, support like picking uh, picking support pickers they do take pickers and they pay them very little money of course i think uh, it was uh, somewhere between the seven and ten american cents uh, per kilogram that they have collected. So uh, kids do, uh, kids are uh, seen on, in the cotton fields. In some of the districts of Dashoguz Velayat, Dashoguz region, the northern region of Turkmenistan, last year we reported that uh, children, oh, the teachers who were uh, obliged to pick cotton, they came to the class and said, hey, uh, who wants to go uh, and replace me? I'll pay you. You know, several kids would raise hands, of course, because uh, for them, probably studying was boring and they would rather, uh, you know, make some uh, pennies extra. Uh, as for the UNICEF and the 
in fact, it could uh, generally be said about uh, all UN institutions in Turkmenistan, they are very inactive. Uh, the, those images probably you've seen on state television or in the media, uh, they always support the government's initiatives. They always say that uh, everything in the country is, is uh, beautiful and rosy. Uh, even with the COVID pandemic uh, last year and this year, uh, the local WHO office uh, or the, the, lo the local UN office said not a single word about the situation with uh, coronavirus in Turkmenistan, even though the virus affected them as well. We reported about, for example, that the driver of the OSCE center in Ashgabat uh, had died from uh, coronavirus yet they again meet with the president or with um, Turkmen ministers and they support the official line. Uh, these organizations, uh, I think after the death of Sapar Murat Niyazov, our first president, have become very inactive. They are uh, not uh, demonstrating initiative, they're not raising really important questions, the questions that concern the society or particular groups of society. Uh, and they're very close from the media. Several times we tried to approach them in, in writing through the phone, they simply won't talk to us. And that's weird, weird because uh, you know the UN supports uh, rights and freedoms, uh, press freedom, et cetera. However, the Turkmen uh, UN agencies, the UN agencies in Ashgabat that have offices in Ashgabat, they play by the Turkmen rules, by the official Turkmen government rules, and don't engage with the civil society. Uh, thank you, Ruslan. Do we have anything to add from that from our other panelists? Okay, um, in which case we have a question from Grady Vaughn, who is a graduate student at Columbia University. Um, he wants to know, um, if the forced diversion of land once dedicated to the cultivation of wheat and other food products um, during, a, during a former food, food shortage to the production of cotton could be a source of local activism moving forward. Um, he recalls a May 2020 protest carried out by a group of women in Dashugus uh, when, a local, when the local governor, uh, Serdar Moretta visited the area. Seems like a perfect question for Farid to answer if he's willing to do so. Farid, would you be willing to respond to whether or not you think that this could be a source of prompting activism? Как уже было отмечено выше, блоков достаточно прибыльный бизнес, я имею в виду для Well, as it was mentioned many times before, cotton production is very profitable, a profitable business for the government. And uh, nowadays, when the prices for oil and gas are dropping, I I, I don't expect the local government to um, actually decide on giving up growing cotton and grow decide on growing something else instead. Of course, we had some historical uh, cases when we're, then there were attempts to grow, say, wheat instead of cotton, etc. But uh, actually, those were not really successful ones. And um, again, you have to understand how the, the state system works uh, in the country. Again, of course, uh, uh, the, every governmental official can understand that it is not really productive and efficient to use the uh, the, the, the resources of uh, governmental employees to send them to the fields to work there. They know it's very unprofitable, but they have to report to their uh, top management, to those people who are above them in the higher state hierarchy and to confirm that they are doing their making efforts to fulfill the uh, plan. So again, we have this very strong vertical of power. And uh, uh, again, we know that all the problems in the country and addressed in a forcible way. The fact that farmers are being forced to grow cotton instead of food as the country is experiencing food shortages could inspire some activism or some further protests to try to either just simply protest the food shortages or to try to convince the government to change its agricultural policies? 
Я неоднократно уже высказывал такое... Well. Я не знаю, это мое убеждение в, каком, в какой-то мере. Okay. Дело в том, что из-за am... уровня безработицы... Она не sure. That because of the high unemployment rates, the most active uh, part of our population is now working abroad, mainly in Turkey. And many young people whose families can afford sending them abroad, they also prefer uh, going uh, to study abroad. So this most active part, this capable, capable young people and students, they are beyond the territory of Turkmenistan. And who is left in Turkmenistan? These are elderly people, these are vulnerable groups, people who work for the state, who depend on the state. They grab onto their positions. They don't, they are afraid to lose these positions. Old, old people, they are afraid to lose their pensions because they are grateful even for those pensions that are really very small. So that's why the activism generally is very low. And again, as I mentioned before as well, people have to register um, on their, at their place of residence. They cannot move around. So the mobility is a very, very, very limited. Uh, and um, again, I don't think that today they have a choice actually. So even in the, given this shortage of food uh, and this limited of choice of the crops to grow. So even if there is any activism going on, this is more mainly activism that is inspired, that is triggered by those Turkmen people who live abroad rather than those Turkmen citizens who live inside the country now. Uh, do we have anyone else who'd like to add anything? Okay. Um, in which case, we have a question from Marius Fossum from the Norwegian Helsinki Committee. Um, he asked um, what legislation or mechanisms are in place in European countries to combat imp the import of goods tainted with forced labor? Um, I think there are still, it's still in the debate and discussion stage. I think there are proposals uh, by groups to uh, recommending that EU enact similar import bans, but as of now, there isn't um, a legislation that is in force to prohibit importation, but it could be reality soon. Thank you. Um, so uh, I want to ask, um, going back to a question that Allison started off with, um, she started her initial comments about how often Turkmenistan is seen as intractable, no progress can be made. Um, I'm curious, um, like it's already quite clear that there's already a lot of very important, excellent work being done by Turkmen civil society and other international groups to address forced labor and other human rights issues in Turkmenistan. Um, what can be done that isn't? Um, so both from civil society and what, um, can international organizations, donors, um, and IFIs, everybody, what, what can be done that isn't? What's the low-hanging fruit? Farid or Ruslan, do you want to start with this? That's a very broad question, Jeff. Um, most important, I think, for the Turkmen civil society, at least, is that um, uh, the our work is uh, continued uh, with uh, preferably with no interruption. Uh, some from some donors, we hear that, uh, for example, Turkmenistan is uh, uh, getting off the priority list, which is uh, sad. Uh, there is no. There's nothing that indicates, uh, you know, democratic changes in the in, in in the country or any other reforms. We don't understand why uh, Turkmenistan is losing this priority. Uh, but uh, as Allison said in the beginning, it's not uh, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh, it it takes time. We see that uh, in the coming maybe one year or two years there will be change in the government, because as you probably recently heard that uh, Turkmenistan's president 
uh, in violation uh, to the constitution of Turkmenistan has become uh, a member of the Majlis, uh, the, the parliament of Turkmenistan. Uh, this leads us to a thought that uh, he would soon be replaced by his son, who will in September turn 40 years old, 40 years. Uh, and uh, that is the age that uh, allows anybody to run for presidency. Uh, maybe with the coming of Serdar Berdomuhamedov, and there is no doubt, and there should be no doubt, doubt that he would be Turkmenistan's uh, third president. So with his uh, coming to power, there would be some moderate, some very small cosmetic, if you want, uh, changes and reforms uh, in, in, in Turkmenistan, just like when Berdo Muhammad himself came to power, uh, when he restored uh, education, he restored pensions, etc., and allowed uh, citizens to use uh, the internet. Now that's a, also, you know, we're back to the old times where, where uh, even access to internet is being blocked. Uh, all uh, all of our uh, websites are being blocked in Turkmenistan. So uh, there is hope that uh, some cosmetic things uh, will be, uh, cosmetic changes will be happening in Turkmenistan in the coming two years probably. And of course that gives us uh, a window of uh, opportunity to voice ourselves again and, uh, you know, say the things that we want, would like to see uh, in Turkmenistan changing, including the forced labor issue. Jeff, you're on mute still. Thank you. Free, do you want to add something? Uh, <coughs> yes. Well, for many years already, we have been trying to attract the attention of different, different media uh, to what is happening in Turkmenistan. We try to uh, advocate to media tycoons and giants, but unfortunately, we have still very limited, limited number of media who uh, put Turkmenistan in their focus. Uh, and uh, by the way, many of uh, international media, they use our websites, uh, our channels uh, to, to actually get some news about Turkmenistan from us. Um, and uh, again, we produce some uh, funny, funny videos about Berdi Muhammadov, and they are very popular. By the way, they attract attention uh, to the country with uh, such a president uh, who, who is not quite adequate uh, to, to his post. And this is also a way to attract the attention of uh, media giants uh, to our country and to use them as a tool, as a mediator to spread the word. Uh, because again, I, I think that this is the tool that we need to use. To add a couple of words, I'd love to do that. Um, you had asked, you know, what can donors do? What can inter international institutions do? And Farid and Ruslan have both offered, I think, excellent points already. But, you know, the work that they're doing the work that Farid and Ruslan are doing is so critical um, and the work of others like them of, of not only exposing abuses to the outside world, but also doing it by cultivating networks of people inside Turkmenistan who can understand, document and report out on their own situations. And that is really building civil society, even though it can be hard to see because the country remains closed and because the work is so dangerous and people do it at such great personal risk. It's also incredibly important. I think it's important to build up this base of, of activists that can begin to take a more active role if there is ever an opening. And it's important also that they not be completely isolated, that they feel the support of um, you know, outside institutions. I mean, ultimately it will be the people of Turkmenistan that change Turkmenistan. And I think it's the job of those of us on the outside to listen to them and to support them and to really continue to invest. I mean, I think there is a such a, a bigotry when it comes to Central Asia and Turkmenistan in particular, where uh, I think we tend to write it off very easily in the West. Um, 
and to think that somehow, you know, democracy, human rights, it's all well and good as standards, but don't really apply. I mean, I think, I think that we really need to work as hard as we can to counter that kind of perception and to understand that the people of Turkmenistan have just as much right as anybody else to determine their own future and, and for us to, to, to support that work. Uh, thank you, Allison. Um, I, we're coming up on the end of the time here. So I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us. So thank you, Allison, Farid, uh, Ruslan, and Anna Suya. Um, all your comments were excellent. Um, I think we ended it on a good note um, and a positive note that actually there is a great deal that can be done and um, uh, we only need to be proactive. Um, I also want to thank all of Ned's support staff for helping make this event possible. Um, Zoom webinars are quite new to us and they did an excellent job. Um, so, and I will, finally, I wanna thank all of our attendees for attending. There are not enough Turkmenistan events, particularly focused on human rights, and there aren't enough people interested in it. Thank you for uh, uh, participating and thank you for all your excellent questions. We look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a great Friday and a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. We're happy to follow up by email if we didn't get the chance to answer your question. Mm -hmm.